Young Joanna at 17 years old, man. She was doing everything she could to be financially independent and get rid of debt because bad credit ain't cute. What's going on, everybody? It's me, Joe. So I'm prepping for my podcast that's going to be coming out. It's going to be called Not Your Average Joe. And a lot of the topics that you guys want to hear about are about finances. And it's great because I've learned a lot about finances over the past few years, specifically the minute I turned 17 when I became independent, when I left the house and never went back. And I was thinking like, man, I've been doing a lot of adulting recently. Recently, like I recently moved to a new apartment. I have a full-fledged company shut up and go people are on payroll So anyways after having made all of these very adult like decisions and thinking about how most of you guys want to travel and Just like me and Damon when we were younger We would dream of traveling and we didn't know how to financially do it I'm gonna walk you through all of the things that I wish I knew when I was just starting to want to travel and want to live the life that I currently now live. Not saying that this is the best advice ever, there are experts that'll probably give you better advice, but this is all what I've learned from trial and error. Let's talk sh money. Money starts before you actually open your first checking account, it does. It's rooted in your family. If your family has money, you will be educated about money and therefore you will make better financial decisions. That is not the case for somebody like me, as an immigrant, my mom was too busy trying to survive, so thriving was never an option. If you come from a family that has no money or is just scrambling to make ends meet, you're probably going to only learn how to do that. And then you're going to be a part of this vicious cycle of the richer get richer and the poor just stay poor. You don't get to pick where you're born or what family you're born into. And so the best thing to do here is realize what your financial background looks like based on your family history. Because the minute you know, at least that knowledge is going to help you offset whatever you don't know or might need to know. For instance, when I realized that my mom, as a single mother, immigrant, barely speaking English, undocumented, was never going to be the financial hero that I needed, I was like, shit, I need to learn about this ASAP because no one else is going to teach me. And that's not my mom's fault. She did her part. We always had food on the table. The last thing you're going to think about is investments because you're just worried about work the next day for another 12 hours. And so you numb yourself in this cycle of work that never ends and it's not a winning formula. The only reason I'm not poor is because of the internet. And that's because the internet gives you the capacity to make passive income. So the first tip of advice is find a job that you can make money while you sleep. It can be having a YouTube channel, it could be drop shipping, if you don't know what drop shipping is, Google it, it can be being a graphic designer or using one of your skills. You need to find a way to make money remotely without your hours being attached to a dollar amount because if you're playing this game where it's like I'm getting paid $15 an hour, you will never win because your spending will always be higher than what you're able to make because there are only 24 hours in the day. And that applies for anybody who wants to travel too. If you're making money passively on the internet, your work is not fixed to a location. So you could be a graphic designer working for a client who's based in the US when you're gallivanting in Africa. So the next tip that I want to talk about is financial independence, everybody. Let's say you want to travel abroad. Your parents don't want you to. If you have the money in your bank account and if you're older than 18, you can legally do whatever the f you want because it's your money. Here's a personal little anecdote. When it was time to buy my prom dress, I thought about how my mom used to treat my sister. And my sister is three years older than me, so at least I had that. I could observe what was happening to my sister to try to not let it happen to me. My mom was like, yeah, we're going to go prom dress shopping. I'm going to buy you a dress on clearance. I saw my mom was controlling my sister's choices based on my mom being the one with the credit card. So the minute that I realized that, I was like, oh, this is an easy game. The money is mine. The decision is mine. So the minute that you can get your hands on your own money, you become financially independent and nobody else has the power over you. Of course, there are morals and ethics that you should always abide by. At the end of the day, respect is respect and your parents are your parents. But really, if it's something that you want to do in your life and you can afford it, do it. No one should hold you back because all you need to make that transaction is that guap. So hand over the cash and do whatever you want to do. But if you're not financially independent, you shouldn't even be having your own opinion because somebody else is going to be paying for your decisions and they're going to be making those decisions because their interest is in that decision because they're paying for it. Moving on. I really, 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 this is like a, an issue I'm really passionate about. Young people of color. 
understand that we are not starting at zero. We are starting at negative 1000 and not because of our parents fault, but because there is literally a racial wealth gap. I'm going to link a documentary down below. It's brilliant. It's just a 22 minute episode and it talks about here in the USA and I'm definitely sure all over the world, there are racial wealth gaps based on policies that prevented people of color from getting ownership of property and property is the most safe investment. If your family doesn't own property that then gets passed on to you, you're starting at negative. Whereas a person from an all American white family is going to have more than you. So when you think about your jobs and like your friends are doing this and that, forget about what anybody else is doing and realize that you're not starting at zero boo boo. So you got to work that much harder because you're not playing a fair game. I'm urging, I'm urging people of color, minorities and immigrants to take a better look at their finances because it's really critical that we know where our money's going and how our money is growing so that we can move forward and try to have a fighting chance of closing that wealth gap because that gap is big it's like that gap needs braces it is so big so i have the saying that it takes a penny to be a millionaire aka stockpile your money live below your means and try to only invest in things that return for instance, I'm only gonna make purchases if I can mathematically prove that it's a wise decision. My coffee machine, for example, it was $250. But after six months of that coffee machine, I had already saved money on coffees because I wasn't going out every single day getting two $5 coffees. Same thing with college. We stress this all the time. College is a business decision. If at the end of your four years, you're gonna have a degree that'll validate that price of the debt in terms of what you're gonna be making as a salary, it's a smart decision. If it's a sunk cost, don't do it because you're not going to be making a wise decision financially. So basically before you make a big purchase or any purchase really think about if it's a sunk cost or if this is an investment cost. Sunk cost meaning that it does nothing, it goes nowhere. You pay for the coffee, you drink the coffee, it's done. You have to buy another coffee now. As opposed to a coffee machine, you buy the coffee machine, you make your own coffee. In the long run, you save money. That's why owning is always the best decision because when you pay rent, you're just throwing money out. If you own property, it'll grow over time and you'll always have a place to stay and you won't have to pay rent anymore. Ooh, it's getting hot in here. The money talk is riling me up. Next piece of advice. Okay, let's talk more about spending. When you buy something, if it makes you feel more productive and therefore more excited about work, I say buy it. For instance, paying for a good gym membership, it'll make you go to the gym and that'll make your body feel better. Buying better food, it might be a little bit more expensive, but if your body is filled with the right things, you will perform at a higher level. So those investments are not dumb investments. Those are all investments back into your well-being so that you can work at a better level and just like feel better about your life and enjoy the things that you're spending money on to experience. If it's like alcohol, recently I've stopped drinking as much. I love a good glass of wine and it can open up my writing chakras. But honestly, when I started realizing like, wait, I'm spending so much money on alcohol and then I wake up feeling like shit the next day and then I'm not productive. So then I don't work. So I spent money to not make any money. It's just a dumb idea. And that's why I've slowed down on my drinking. That ain't because of my hives. So the more you can identify these items that you don't really need, that don't benefit you in any real way, I think the better off you are in terms of your spending. Let's talk about credit for a second and credit cards in general. When you have a credit card bill, always pay in full if you can. And if you can't pay in full, always pay more than a minimum. If I were you, I would set up auto pay to pay the last balance so that you never get hit with an APR interest rate that is ridiculously high. Hi. So let's talk about APR for a second. APR is annual percentage rate. This is the rate that'll be tacked on every single billing cycle and for credit cards the average is 19 freaking percent. If you're just accumulating debt on top of debt you lost the game. Sit on the sidelines, put that credit card away and pay it off until it's paid off completely. Then you can hop back in the game once your credit is clean. Next piece of advice, invest in yourself. Okay yes I believe in investing in stocks and we're gonna get to that. But if you think about your paycheck and cut it into slivers and reinvest 10% of that paycheck into a project that you know that you can make more money with. At the end of a few months, you're gonna have seed investments for your own idea and therefore can become a full-blown entrepreneur. It doesn't happen overnight, it happens little by little. So if you set that intention, I wanna start a business, put 10% of your money into a special account and then you know that that's your investment money. That is your personal projects fund. Same thing applies for a trip. If you wanna become a travel writer and you wanna go on a trip, 
take a little bit of your money, put it away every single month, and then you know that that is your investment for your trip so that when you're on the trip, you can write your ass off, get partnerships, and get things paid for. So it's an investment that returns, and that's a smart investment. Diversify your income. What that means is that you have various things moving money for you. This is what rich people do, and so why not think like that? For example, we have Damon and Joe, we have Shut Up and Go, we have our individual accounts, Joe Franco, Damon Dominique. We have a series of other projects that we're working on that has nothing to do with being on camera. Selling merch, throwing events, doing language courses, ebooks and that's how you diversify your income so don't just think i'm gonna put all my eggs in this basket and this is gonna make my money no 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 childish think what are the three ways that you can diversify your income and make all of those things move at once because god forbid one of those things stops working you have your other things to fall back on for financial prosperity namaste let's say you're in debt let's say you're in debt and you're stressing you don't know what to pay off first right this is a problem a lot of people have what i suggest is looking at what has the highest apr rate if you're talking about credit cards credit cards have the highest apr rates at 19 percent average in comparison to like a student loan which if your student loan is not a parent plus loan it's like an eight percent rate that rate is really important because that'll show you that you're gonna be spending more money in a shorter amount of time than you intended on. So look at what has the highest percentage of interest and try to kill that as soon as you possibly can because the more time that thing sits in your debt, the more money you're gonna owe. Or another strategy is to pay off whatever is the smallest amount. So if you have a credit card that's $500 and an account that has $1,000 but the APR is higher, Maybe you want to have peace of mind to know you only have one thing to pay back so you pay off the 500 in full and then you focus on tackling that big $1,000 debt. I personally go with paying a little bit of everything but really killing the highest APR rate because at the end of the day, it'll save me more money. With my student loans, for instance, I was juggling two different accounts. I was paying off the Parent PLUS loan that was in my mom's name with highest interest and my own. And so I killed my mom's first because I knew that the highest interest rate would get me. And so once hers was killed, even though I was paying mine at the same time, I was like, all right, sweet. I can like relax a little bit more because 8% APR is way less than like 12%, which was what her loan was. Let's talk credit. In the States, we have the system. It's credit. It's terrible. It'll make or break you. If you want to do anything in your life, you're going to need to do it with good credit. So I use Credit Karma. This isn't a sponsored video. This is just genuinely what I use. Log on to Credit Karma and I look at what my credit score is all the time so I can see what's going good, what's going bad. You should know what's happening on the back end of your credit. That's how I actually found out that a credit card was taken out in my name and maxed out was because I was on Credit Karma and I saw like, hold up, I don't know that card, what the hell is going on? And then I found out what it was. But had I not been investigating just to do my like annual or biannual checkup on my credit at that point in my life, I wouldn't have caught on and it would have created a huge problem. Let's talk budgeting. How do you know what you could pay for if you don't know how much money you're gonna be making? Here's what I always do. I take a piece of paper every single month to give me peace of mind and I write down every single expense. I a budget out for groceries. How much do I spend every week? Times that by four. What does that look like in a month? And then on the other column, I write down every single thing that I'm going to be doing to make money. Whether that's part-time jobs or sponsorships or whatever, put that on that column. And at the end of the month, what you should see is your expenses are less than what you make in that month. That's what I've been doing since I was in college, super broke, and it's worked like a charm. It's given me peace of mind. And in that budget, allocate your debt payment as well. And so if you're paying $200 off every month, put that in the budget and know that you need to make X amount of dollars to just pay for your cost of living, which means that you gotta make more than your cost of living so you can thrive. Apps for budgeting, there's an app that I used to use called Mint, and it's it's really beautiful. It'll like break down in a graph what you should be spending on what. And for investments, I use an app called Acorns. Acorns is not the only app like this, but Acorns is an app that'll be a robotic investor for you. You choose your investment portfolio, whether it's like very risky, very conservative, or somewhere in between, you choose your risk profile. And Acorns will basically take your money and invest it in that portfolio of whether it's stocks and bonds, large companies, small companies, and you'll learn learn how to invest even though you're not the one investing. Well, technically you are because it's your money, but essentially sit on that investment. Put money in there, don't think about it. Let your money grow for you. So sitting on money in the market is the smartest thing you can do and that's how wealthy people stay wealthy because they have enough money to put aside that they don't even need to look at. 
So even if you're not making a lot of money, you could still think, okay, a tiny sliver of my bank account, I don't need. I'm putting it into this investment account and I'm never gonna touch that money until I absolutely need it when I'm like 90 years old. Boom, you have your retirement set up. Check the link down below and invest in Acorns or other robot investors. You can do a quick Google search, just look up robot investment app. So a lot of people will say, oh Joe, why don't I just put all of my money in a savings account instead? Savings accounts usually have terrible APYs, annual percent yielded, which means your money will sit in that savings account and make no money for you. My savings account, for instance, has a pathetic 0.01% APY, meaning if I have bajillions of dollars in that savings account, I'll get like $1 at the end of the year. Whereas if you put that money in a stock market, I'm up 19% right now. The same way I diversify my income, I diversify where my money lives. So while I think it's silly that savings accounts have terrible APY rates, I still have money in savings accounts. The same way that stock markets are risky, but you know they yield more results, so I put some money in the stock market. The same way that I use my credit cards and the same way that I have a checking and savings, I have my money in all different kinds of places because it helps me compartmentalize what each account is for. I have the business account checking, the business account savings, the personal checking, the personal savings, the Acorns account, and then I have all my credit card accounts. Diversify your cash flow because if some shit hits the fan, you're gonna need money and it might not be where you usually keep it. And you should probably have some cash stashed somewhere in your house too. But don't be like my grandpa who had like an envelope of money under his mattress for so long that it molded and then all of the money basically disintegrated. All right, I put I posted this on my Instagram. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm doing a video about all of the financial advice I wish somebody gave me. And I wanna do a Q and A portion, so please submit all your financial questions. Maybe I'll be able to answer them. If not, I will find your answer. And here are some of my favorite questions. Tomas Serra, a good friend of mine, he asks, how to get rich very easily. What I said earlier, make money passively. Think about something that you can do that will snowball into more money. So whether that's spending a little bit of money developing a product that can live on sale forever, that's what I'm talking about. Like where you are removed from the money making process. So it's just, it's an investment. You literally just invest in something over time and it makes its own money. Make your money work for you. That's how people get rich. That's how people stay rich. Next question. How do credit cards work? I kind of explained that already, but essentially you get a credit limit. Credit limit is anything from like $500, which was my pathetic first credit limit, to an unlimited amount of money. At the end of the month, you should be paying in full or close to the full amount, and then they incentivize you with the point systems, right? And the point systems will allow you to earn on top of things that you would already be buying. And that's how you win at credit cards. Somebody says, stressed. I have an opportunity to move to New York City in January, but everything is money. Let me tell you something, Vicky775, money is everything and it's all the time. And so get comfortable with the relationship cause we out here making love to money or hate. But here's how you love money. When you're moving, this is when you think about getting a credit card that has a sign-up bonus. You're gonna be spending that money anyways. So you might as well pick a credit card that gives you a, one hell of a sign-up bonus. So then, not only will you have moved, but in a few months, you could take a trip for free on your credit card points. Yes, it sucks, New York City is very expensive, but again, if you follow the advice, will moving to New York yield you more opportunities and therefore more financial prosperity? If yes, it's a smart move. If you're gonna move to New York City and you're not sure or you don't really wanna hunt down a job that makes more money for you, it's not a good decision. So if you're going to New York City, get ready to work your ass off. I always ask this question and nobody ever tells me the answer because I think it's really subjective based on how you live. Somebody asks, how much money do you need in your bank account to feel comfortable? When, when I moved to LA in 2015 with Damon to start the channel, I had a shit ton of credit card debt, a shit ton of student loan debt, and I think I had $5,000 in my bank account. And for some reason I was like, okay, $5,000, that gives me four months at least to figure it out. And four months to me felt comfortable. With that said, I'm moving to a major city, I didn't have any family, I didn't have any friends, I didn't have a job. And so I really had to start scrambling from scratch with like making money on the YouTube channel 
I know how to budget and save, but wealthy people know that money makes money. How do I invest? So you could start by joining Acorns and doing that robot investor. You can do what I mentioned, which is investing in yourself in a business idea that you have that will then yield more money in the long run. Or you can actually get into the stock market. You can open a Scott Trade account. You invest in your own companies that you're excited about. Because investments are basically, you're saying you believe in a certain company enough to spend money to help them grow. You get a piece of their company, and if their company thrives, you make returns. That's all investment is. So if you think about that to apply it to your own life, if you have a business idea that's just as good, might as well invest it back into yourself first. How do I pay for college? Oh God, the worst. I'm gonna make a whole video on like how I paid off my college in detail. And there's a podcast episode coming on that too, so stay tuned, but essentially I would look at what has the highest interest rate and kill that as soon as you possibly can. Pay interest while you're still in college and pay everything off at the same time, but like know what you're up against. So look at how much you even owe. Most people don't even know how much money they, they owe. And that's mistake number one, so investigate. At the end of the day, this is your money. Whether it's your money or not, because you owe it, it's still money that you're gonna have to pay. So get used to knowing what it is. Best advice for a college student that is broke AF. When you're thinking about your friend group, be very aware of who you're friends with. Because if a friend is spending a bunch of money and that friend has a financially different circumstance than you, you need to be smart. You need to be the responsible one. You can't be doing the same thing everybody else is doing if your financial circumstance is not the same. So from the jump, I would very, very, very quickly identify what is your financial situation and are your friends in similar places? Because nothing will make your finances deplete faster than trying to keep up with friends that have more money than you. You'll never win. And so yes, you can have friends that have different financial backgrounds from you, but you're gonna realize that you'll need to sit out in certain of those activities. Best saving advice. Will you think about this item or will this make a difference in your life in a year? If not, you probably don't need it. Save that money. Such a good question. Did you have an aha money moment, AKA an emotional money learning moment? I did. I had a really scary moment. I had freshly graduated from college. I had had free housing for the last two years because I was an RA to scam the system so I wouldn't have to pay for housing. Once I graduated, that housing ended. I didn't have a place to stay and I refused to move back home. So I ended up going out to breakfast with my friend Paige, who was just an acquaintance at the time. She tells me, come live on my couch. And I'm like, I don't even know you. We've only met two times. And she's like, I don't care, live on my couch. That was a moment where I realized like my friends and my family were in financially similar situations as I was. So they were unable to help me. And for once I had to take help from somebody that was a stranger who became my best friend. And that was an aha moment where I was like, shit, I'm in this on my own. I gotta figure this out. And so I took that month on the couch and I like, really looked at what my financial plan was gonna be. And I started living well below my means. I split a room with somebody in Harlem and another aha moment came when I needed to pay for the first month, last month and the security deposit and I had no money. And I had never asked my mom for money ever, ever, ever. Call my mom, I'm like, mom, all I need is $500. I'm getting paid on Friday. Can you just give me the money now and I'll pay you back in two days. And she didn't have the money to give me. And I was like, oh my God, I need to figure this out because I'm gonna be homeless if I don't. That day I get a phone call from a catering event company that I had applied to and they had a job for me that day that would pay me exactly what I needed to move in. And it was that moment where I was like, I gotta have my own back because like my family loves me, but financially nobody's there to help me. And now the opposite has happened. I'm the financial rock. So aha moment was when I realized nobody could financially help me and that was a scary moment, but it also made me step up to the plate and realize like I gotta figure this out now and I can't really play these games with my money because if some shit happens to me, I'm the only person who has my back financially and that's scary, but I think that's why I've learned what I've learned. Another question is, when did I start saving? I started saving as soon as I started working, which was when I was eight years old. My mom would make us go and clean the office with her. She called it family bonding because when you're an immigrant, bonding is cleaning houses so that you can make money, so that you have food on the table. I took it as a learning opportunity. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna sit here, I'm gonna clean this toilet, whatever, I'm gonna work. And at the end of every shift, every week, my mom would pay us $30. So as an eight year old, like totally not okay with the child, like working laws, but I was fine helping her and I'm glad now because I learned 
that every week if I worked I would have $30 and if I didn't spend that $30 the next week I'd have $60 and then I'd have $90 and then I'd have $120 and after six months I'd almost have $1,000 and that's when I started saving was when I was eight years old working with my mom and then the first chance that I had to apply for a real job I applied and I got that job and I was obsessed I was obsessed with making my own money because I knew that it would create my freedom financial independence financial independence financial independence I'm gonna make t-shirts I think it's important to have these conversations I think it's important to ask people what their financial planning is because it's so hush hush it's so taboo so leave it to me to blab about it on YouTube anyways I think I've blabbed enough for the day I hope you guys learned something please leave your best financial advice down below in the comments don't forget to subscribe and like this video if you want to keep your money growing I'm gonna try to like figure out where this light okay the windows just the sunlight is creeping in follow me on social media to find out more about my podcast because we're gonna be covering a lot of these topics money mental health awareness love all these things that I could blab on for days and days on end all right everybody I'm gonna see you later bye